Thank you, everyone, and I want to thank Peter for organizing this and inviting me and for American University putting it on, and, of course, to Meredith Jacob, who did a great job uh, organizing, and all the panelists know what work she did uh, for this event. Uh, I do have a stopwatch running, Peter, so uh, I will abide by our agreement for seven minutes, but maybe not less. Um, for me, the story really starts uh, a little over four years ago when a man named Dave Kapos had been nominated to be Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property. And Dave was and is a very good professional friend, and he and I were talking before his confirmation about different strategic issues related to his confirmation hearings. And during those conversations, he said to me, well, Justin, if, if I am confirmed, I want you to be an advisor. 
And I thought to myself, well, Dave says that to all the boys, right? So uh, I thought nothing of it, and he was confirmed. And then he called me, and he said, I'd like you to be an advisor. And I said, I don't want to live in Washington. And he said, would you do it part time? And I said yes, not realizing that that was how the government would get you to take a full-time job and only pay you half a salary. <laughs> so uh, a few months into this new job, um, I got sent to Geneva. And I was sent to Geneva partly because the White House felt that we had a problem with the issue of copyright exceptions and limitations for the visually impaired, and that the US position needed refinement, improvement, and let's just be blunt, redevelopment. And in December 2009, the US announced a change in policy. And we said we favored the formation of new international legal norms that would govern the creation of exceptions and limitations for books and for printed materials for the blind, particularly on the issue of cross-border sharing of special format copies for the blind. Now, there's a policy reason for that. At, that was a period when the United States Patent and Trademark Ruff and the, uh, the USPTO and the Copyright Office had jointly completed a study that seemed to indicate that was really the problem. But the truth is, the administration was able to do that because there was political leadership. Political leadership in the form of people like Dave Kapos and Kareem Dale in the White House, who believed that intellectual property is important, it should be strong, but it doesn't need to percolate into and govern every corner of human existence. And the position we announced was that we believed both in better exceptions in copyright law and better enforcement of copyright law. Now, you'd think a moderate position like that should be easy to sell. And if you listen to the public rhetoric of all the players involved in intellectual property, you would think so. But it isn't. And the truth is that's because the true positions of people in the intellectual property field are both more strident and more ingrained. And that is true on both sides. So for me, personally, I want to tell you that working on the Marrakesh Treaty was a wonderful experience because I had the pleasure of being attacked constantly on all sides. <laughs> and many, many years ago when I was young, I had the experience of being the driver, literally the driver, for Bill and Hillary Clinton. And so often during this process, I would think about something that happened to President Clinton or Secretary of State Clinton, and I'd go, this is nothing. Uh, so let the attacks roll on. <laughs> anyway. Uh, what happened in 2010 is the United States ended up formulating a proposal which we submitted. And this proposal was for what we called a consensus instrument. That is, the norms that could take the form of either a joint recommendation at WIPO or ultimately the form of a treaty. And we expressly said we were open to what form it was. At the time, the European Union also proposed what they would call a joint recommendation. And I don't want to turn this into a seminar on public international law, but these are important differences. And the Africa Group proposed a very sweeping and broad treaty on a range of exceptions and limitations on all issues. These three proposals came in the context of Brazil and Paraguay and Ecuador having already made a proposal on behalf of the World Blind Union. And that was a draft treaty on the copyright exceptions and limitations that had been prepared by the World Blind Union in conjunction with Knowledge Ecology, which uh, Jamie Love is with us today. Now, um, from that point on, and I'll just summarize, I'd love to tell you the details and love to tell you some of the good and the bad and the ugly. But we successfully launched what was called a four-way process between Brazil, uh, joined by Mexico, the United States, the European Union, and the Africa Group. The truth was that it was often difficult, very, very difficult, in 2010, 2011, and early 2012 to get the Africa Group completely engaged on the process. But we were able to do it, and it ultimately bore fruit. And this was an extremely difficult process, I'll tell you. The year before, I had led the delegation that had negotiated the Beijing Treaty. And uh, this was far, 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 far more difficult than the Beijing Treaty. It was difficult, and this is something I hope we'll be able to talk about, because this treaty negotiation was not just about the blind, but it became a battleground for different interest groups fighting about different things. In the context of Geneva, it was a field of struggle 
for the struggle between developed countries and developing countries that percolates through all the activities in the international organizations in Geneva and especially at the WIPO. For the United States, it was a matter of building bridges with many countries with whom we have had difficult relationships in multilateral intellectual property negotiations and which we succeeded in doing. I have to tell you quite honestly that a lot of the people who are here today, whether it's the libraries or the publishers or the Motion Picture Association, saw this issue, this treaty, this instrument as a area where it was vitally interested for them as to what kind of precedents were going to be established. And that really was what uh, made it so difficult at the end. And I will tell you uh, the last anecdote, because I have about 30 seconds, Peter, is that the first few days of the Marrakesh Diplomatic Conference, we believed it was going to fail. And um, no one was more frightened of this than the Moroccan government, since they were hosting it. And the nominal president of the conference was the Minister of Communications of uh, Morocco. And he called me into his office and said, what can we do to salvage this? And I gave him very short, pithy advice that was um, repeated more often than I had intended. I said to him, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, my best advice to you is close the airports. Um, because <laughs> you will get agreement if the airports are closed and no one can leave until there's an agreement. So um, we didn't have to do that. Uh, we had some good breakthroughs at about day five or six. And uh, we were all very, very pleased with the result, which I think is a balanced, a balanced instrument but I have to say is really just the first step in improving the global system to get accessible formats to people with uh, visual impairments. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Justin. And now what I'd like to do is just to say a word about each of our other panelists, again, with, with, with apologies, but I could go on and then, and then begin the conversation. So with us, we have from, from, from my right down, Chris Markage, who is the President and Managing Director of the Motion Picture Association for Europe, Middle East, and Europe. Professor Ruth Okedeji, who is from the University of Minnesota Law School and who was the Chief Negotiator for the Federal Republic of Nigeria at the Conversations in Marrakesh. Justin, you have met. Scott Lavar, who is a practicing lawyer from Colorado who, by virtue of his long association with the National Federation of the Blind, came to be its chief representative in, in, in Marrakesh and also in Geneva at all of the discussions in the run-up to the final diplomatic conference. Luis Villarroyal, who's the Director of Research for the Latin American Center for Intellectual Property Research for Development and an associate of the Universidad Mayor faculty in Chile, and who has both watched and advocated around this process from the beginning. Let's see, Nancy Weiss, another member of the U.S. delegation to the Marrakesh Diplomatic Conference and all of the meetings that preceded it and, and, and the General Counsel of the uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services and therefore the person who often was in the position of speaking within the delegation for those domestic U.S. cultural interests. And finally, someone you've already heard about, Jamie Love, the Director of, of Knowledge Ecology International, who's personal efforts and organizational efforts play such an important role in getting this process started and keeping it moving. And with that, I wanted to build, to throw out a question for anyone who wants to begin that builds really on one of Justin's last observations, and that is that this was a very difficult negotiation. I wondered if any of you wanted to elaborate a little on what made it difficult? We've heard from Justin some of the things that were a problem, the fact that the negotiation, that the positions in the negotiation became to some extent proxies for larger interests. 
I wonder what else you might point to that caused this to be a hard negotiation for Scott? Thank you, Peter. Uh, I echo what Justin said earlier. I thank you for organizing this, and I thank American University for sponsoring this. Uh, throughout this whole process, this institution has, in my view, been very helpful by getting word of the treaty out and by helping the discussions move forward. I think that this was a very difficult process because it was an animal, it was a creature that the, this particular, particular inter, intellectual property community had not seen. In my view, this treaty is not an IP treaty. Yes, I know it is, but it really isn't. This is a human rights treaty that talks about access to information, access to information for a population that has been critically and historically underserved. And of course, this is a treaty that focused solely on the issues of exceptions and limitations and did not in any way enhance, if you will, or bolster or reinforce or build the rights of rights holders. So this was the kind of animal in WIPO that was not common. And, and of course, people were very concerned about its precedential value. Uh, you know, normally, these copyright treaties uh, deal with protecting the rights of rights holders. And even though everybody was globally supportive of the notion that blind and visually impaired individuals throughout the world ought to receive more inter information and it ought to be easier to get books into the hands of blind people throughout the world, they were very fearful of the norms that would be set and how those norms would be applied to other situations. So I think basically it was the novelty of the situation and the, cro the mixture of human rights issues with intellectual property issues that quite frankly scared a lot of people in this process. Thank you, Scott. Does anyone else want to, to speak to this question of, of the, the obstacles to getting to an agreement? What made the process challenging? Chris? Sure. I, I guess from our perspective, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to be here. Um, uh, from, from the perspective of the Motion Picture Association, what was going on in Geneva uh, in this treaty negotiation uh, was important in its own right, but it also would have implications for future negotiations. And we, we were looking at the process in the context of trying to ensure that there was a result that would satisfy the, 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 the needs, the legitimate, the, the, the compelling demands uh, of the intended beneficiaries of the treaty, while at the same time keeping an eye on, on the future. And this, was a, this treaty is a precedent in the sense that it is, it does, uh, it, it, it is in fact a set of mandatory exceptions and limitations in a standalone instrument, which you really don't have uh, in, in the WIPO. Uh, without substantive obligations accompanying those exceptions and limitations, and they're mandatory, which is another uh, unique element. And so, there, this this does uh, it, it, it does depart from past uh, from the past in certain ways. And we wanted to ensure that some of the tools that are enshrined in the various instruments of the WIPO that ensure a balance uh, uh, in terms of respecting fundamental rights because the protection of authors' rights is also a fundamental right, that that would be respected. And so our, our efforts were geared at trying to ensure that, um, that, that the results of this negotiation would not uh, prejudice the existing uh, body of treaties that exist in the WIPO and also the future negotiations. And so we, we tried to contribute constructively to a process that did what needed to be done and what had to be done and which we had a responsibility to do without doing uh, damage elsewhere. Others? Nancy? Oh, Ruth. Oh, no, Nancy, Ruth and then Nancy and then Ruth. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Nancy Weiss from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And I'll just say that um, our agency's role is to advise the President and Congress on museum, library, and information services to support the education and informational infrastructures of the U.S. I actually predated Justin in this particular uh, issue for about six months. Um, we were actually called in to look at some of the issues that were coming up at the World Intellectual Property Organization on limitations and exceptions. Um, on the agenda were limitations and exceptions for libraries and archives and also for individuals with disabilities. I was looking at this particular issue because our agency actually um, funds the libraries for the blind around the country. We actually complement the role of the National Library Service at the Library of Congress, which makes materials available under the Chafee Amendment um, by supporting the operations of the library, uh, the, the state uh, libraries for the blind, um, helping them to also produce domestic or local materials in the states, uh, as well as um, helping with other organizations that are operating under Chafee. So I, I looked at this issue and also recognized that they're really, this was, this was actually fairly thorny. And this goes back to, you know, what made this challenging. So that um, we see these issues from a number of different perspectives because libraries are purchasing materials and they have a role in purchasing materials that are accessible. They also have this role of making accessible materials under U.S. copyright exceptions. And, um, and we in the United States have actually a very robust copyright exception. And so my concern coming in was how do we do good here and do no harm? <laughs> so in other words, how do you enhance access to information and address the really important need um, that was going on access to accessible format materials without creating um, and f walking right into the issues that Justin was talking about and Chris is talking about, creating bad precedent that actually could do more harm than good. So um, we did uh, consult with the Patent and Trademark Office and we're very happy when, um, when we were able to have somebody helping the delegation who could really help navigate through these very thorny issues. And I think it was very helpful to have somebody from the academic community, and you'll see that for a couple of the key negotiators here, because again, we're trying to look at um, you know, is there a need? What could be done? What would be consistent with international obligations? And how do you synthesize these human rights issues and the copyright system? Because ultimately, it all is about access to information. Hmm. Thank you so much. And thank you, Peter, for the invitation. And Meredith, I want to echo the thanks of everybody to American University at Washington College of Law. Um, this, I am still recovering. <laughs> and, um, you know, at my deep fondness and respect for Peter is the only thing that actually brought me to, to D.C. Um, and to this forum, I will admit. Um, it is somewhat uh, of a reunion, and it's good to see everybody uh, here again. I got plunged, literally, into the process. So I didn't have the privilege or the um, benefit of both being able to think about what the morass of issues would be um, and the kinds of dynamics that would really come to dominate um, the process um, as a whole. Uh, both, uh, I think, Nancy and, and Justin and Chris as well have, have, I think, identified the major sort of concerns um, that interest groups had on both sides. And I think Justin is absolutely correct that this was uh, made very complicated because in general, intellectual property issues have become impossible to talk about without the shadows um, of particular perspectives, particular interests, um, and the deep entrenchment of both of these um, interests and perspectives, these categories of things, in the policy framework in which intellectual property norms are developed. And I think that's true nationally for us in the United States. Um, it is certainly characteristic um, of Geneva. Um, because whatever our respective tensions are domestically, when you negotiate in the context of WIPO in Geneva, this is overridden by um, many other issues um, and many other kinds of relationships that all come to bear 
when it's clear that there's been a political commitment to move forward on a process. So it becomes really a series of negotiations. You're not really just negotiating about um, exceptions and limitations for visually impaired persons. You are negotiating um, between developed and developing country perspectives. You're negotiating um, in the shadows of what's coming down the road. You're negotiating um, almost directly with um, countries that you've had uh, prior relationships with. Um, and all of these things have to be <coughs> sifted um, through. And, and really, I think that the road to Marrakesh was about sifting um, and refining. Uh, how could we get to yes um, without sacrificing broad principles, um, but also making sure that um, what we needed to accomplish was accomplished? And it's clear um, when you read the text of the treaty, I mean, the night we finally got a breakthrough, I don't remember what time it was, um, okay. somebody, somebody, 10.05 and three seconds, uh, somebody sent me a text and said, you were screaming hallelujah. And I probably was, because like Justin, um, there were moments when I did not think that, um, that this would happen. But I wanted to, I thought it'd be helpful to give a brief, um, two comments about the Africa group. Um, I got involved um, leading um, the Nigerian government um, on the negotiations, and that was by way of having uh, worked with the African group ambassadors um, in, um, in Geneva. And the history between um, the Africa group broadly and um, the European Union is just not good, and it doesn't matter what you're talking about. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about intellectual property, agriculture, textiles, human rights, you name it. It's extremely contentious. And within WIPO, um, there had been a long-standing sort of coalition of countries um, that really were concerned, I think, both about WIPO and about the processes at WIPO. Um, these two broad sets of overarching dynamics came to bear um, in this process. And so the Africa Group's position was, we are not going to splinter off a, a treaty for the visually impaired. It has to be something that really deals with a range of what you would, might term public interest concerns um, that were material to uh, socioeconomic development. Um, and so one of the first things that um, I was tasked with uh, was really working with the Africa group to talk about, um, one, principles don't appear to matter much in Geneva. And so taking a principled position about the importance of these issues was probably not the way to go um, if one was going to make any progress um, on any of them. So working with the various um, Africa group um, delegates and ambassadors was itself a mini set of negotiations to get to the point where there was consensus within the group um, because the Africa group votes as a group. Um, to get consensus within the group um, to begin to focus on the road to Marrakesh. Um, and, and that in itself was um, unprecedented, frankly. Um, the idea that you could splice off a narrow set of interests um, in a context in which um, most of the African countries were skeptical about how beneficial the treaty would be um, for the blind in the absence of um, other exceptions or perhaps acknowledgement <coughs> that the conditions that blind persons in Africa were facing um, was very different um, and that the needs would require more than just mandatory exceptions um, at the international level. It was a very emotionally fraught process within the group. Um, <coughs> the different African regions are at various levels of development um, and the countries within the regions um, some being extremely poor um, and some being much more able institutionally to implement. Uh, and so negotiating across those differences became really, uh, really problematic. The second major dynamic that I think um, is not as obvious is also that the Africa group, um, in coordination with the, some of the emerging economies, um, also had dynamics internally to work through because these groups often negotiate on issues like this um, with the set of ideas that we have a common goal, let's figure out how to get there. Um, now, when you are negotiating with um, countries like Brazil that are on the cusp of sort of they're not really developing and, um, you know, the, really in a different political and socioeconomic space, um, the dynamics with 
the least developed countries um, was also something that had to be managed um, appropriately. Now, Nigeria was in an interesting position because as the largest country on the continent um, and with its role in the Africa group, it also has the largest content industry on the continent, in particular with films. And there was an extreme amount of pressure on the government um, to um, both have strong protection um, because of Nollywood um, and an extreme amount of pressure um, on uh, the um, from the visually impaired groups and NGOs, and in particular because Ghana had a president that had just passed away who was visually impaired. For those of you who ever saw um, President Atta Mills, um, you know, he had to have about 25 size font um, to be able to read anything. And, and so for the Ghanaians, they were very emotionally close to the issue. Um, and so Nigeria ended up really brokering a couple of important um, uh, tensions between the group um, and, within the, uh, and within our industry um, internally. Last point, I think, was it was very important to have an academic um, leading the U.S. delegation. Um, and, and frankly, it, um, and I hope I'm not going to embarrass Justin, but it was important to sort of be able to understand the reactions um, of the Africa group and, the, and GRULAC and some of the others because knowing the intellectual history of copyright and understanding the frustrations of um, the developing countries played a major role in those countries being willing to say, okay, we're ready to talk. And um, um, between Jamie, who um, started this idea um, in a small meeting at KEI 10 years ago, and Justin, who kind of brought it to an end this year, um, many, many, many personal relationships had to be brought to the table uh, to make this happen. And those relationships were tested and tried but survived. And I think that says something both about Jamie and Justin in this process. So I'm tempted to move to my no, please, please. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Peter, for the invitation. For me, special and great honor because I am alumni from this law faculty, so I'm especially uh, grateful. <clears throat> I, I would like to, to, to stress that uh, the difficulty of this process was not only because it was creating a precedent, but because it was a change of the culture, how you deal with IP norm setting. Uh, because this process, is, uh, is this process of the, the exceptions treaty started in 2004 with a proposal of, of Chile at the time that I was working you no. Know, for the, the, the Chilean delegation that we propose that it should be an uh, agenda of exceptional limitations mandatory in three areas. One of those was for the blind. And, and that initiative was a reaction to the frustration that we had as a country after negotiating FTA with the U.S. where we saw that FTAs were too uh, tightening the, the flexibility. So we thought that it was important that we discuss multilateral and Exception, something that was not before. So it was not only a precedent, but we had to change the culture of WIPO and how to do norm setting. So during four years, you know, uh, from 2004 to 2008, we were discussing whether it was possible or not to have a treaty on exceptions. And, and those things that uh, I think are very peculiar and tell us about the karma of things is that we met with, with Justin, in, I, I remember 2006 or in, in Cardoso, with, with Ruth and well, James Love and Vera France, that is also with us here, discussing whether it was possible to have a treaty on exceptions uh, academically. So, and, and then we reunited again uh, four years later the, <laughs> as delegated for some strange reason, uh, uh, just in the U.S., uh, Ruth, Nigeria, and I, Ecuador, which was something like a, a, a strange, uh, to say least. So, so we have to change that uh, culture. And, uh, and also, we, we, we found that it, it was so difficult to advance because there was a lack of empathy on the needs of the other side. Especially, we, 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 we thought that it was important to, to, to recognize the, 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 the actual needs of the person that was the stakeholders. So my, my other comment, why was such much uh, difficult, is that, that there were too many lawyers in, in the negotiation. Uh, we, we, we were discussing uh, like uh, TPM provisions. 
you know, the, which was horrible. And, uh, and it, it, at least one, one country proposal we thought that was very bad. And then we, we, we spoke with the people from the, <clears throat> the uh, audiovisual industry, I mean, the, the gentlemen here and all, all the representatives, and they had a, such a much, you know, lighter view than the proposal put on the table. So, and, and that can happen in other issues where, you know, like the lawyers sort of like bring all the nuclear weapons and, and just <laughs> points it to everyone, and, and the problem is not such a, you know, it, human to human, you, you can advance uh, things. And uh, also, uh, and I, I think that was uh, very important to, to solve this uh, process was the, the support of civil society. I, I don't think that uh, this would have been possible w w without the support of uh, of HEI with, with James Love here, or Better France with Open uh, Society Institute, who, who provided a, a lot of the, the infrastructure that many developing countries did not have for negotiating. So, 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 so the good thing is that we, now after this exercise, we have trust, uh, it, uh, we, we have seen that it's possible to, to come to a, a balanced treaty, and, uh, and it's a lot of work that uh, still we might do together. Well, I, and to set the table further, I guess, for the record, one thing we didn't really mention, and maybe it's because we were all so familiar with the process and the history, but maybe not everybody in the room here is. And that is, when you look at the situation worldwide, blind people have access to something like less than 1% of published works in an accessible format. And that's why we called it the book famine. For us, it is a real famine. And the other thing that I think is historically interesting is the World Blind Union was formed in, I believe, Dr. Maurer, you can correct me, but 1984. And from the very beginning of the WBU, this has been an issue, finding a way to create a system of exceptions worldwide so that we can get more access to uh, the books and information. So I, I just wanted to round out the record a little bit on how this, from our perspective, how this got started. And, and then, of course, in 1996 here in the U.S., we got Chafee and so on. So I want everyone to listen very carefully to these panelists because Scott actually focused on the book famine. But if you listened very carefully to what Luis said, because Luis is charming, he's good as a negotiator because he's so charming, get you contractually, sign away your mother before you knew it. <laughs> and Luis said, you know, we have to change the culture. We have to change the culture. I just got done telling you that this, the problem here was that this was a football for bigger issues. The gentleman sitting at this end doesn't want to change the culture. Right? It's not in his interest to change the culture of WIPO. It's in his interest to try to change the culture. I'm here stuck between them. Right? I just want to get the deal done for the blind. So, so, you know, that's an example of how listen very carefully to what people say it was about and what they wanted. Because there's a big difference between what Scott and Luis said. And it's perfectly fine for that to be Luis's goal. And it's perfectly reasonable for that to be Luis's goal from his perspective. But listen to the difference. Now, a little thought on Ruth said it was very important for an academic to be leading the U.S. delegation, and, and that's very kind of her to say. But I want to tell you the real reason that was important. Um, my former boss, Under Secretary Kapos, came from IBM, as many of you know, and his deputy, the deputy under secretary, came from a Chicago law firm. And the head of international affairs at PTO at the time was Artie Rye, a good friend of many of the academics who teaches patent law at Duke. And one day the four of us were hanging out and I said, look guys, we have to be very careful here because our political calculus will be different than the political calculus of most of the people we are dealing with who live inside the Beltway. Their next job depends on them being good to the people around them. Whereas we're the ones who will come in here and say, uh, let's do the right thing for a change because we have existences outside the Beltway. And the bottom line is, I, my experience, sorry, my experience, so now Washington has turned off the microphone <laughs> uh, <laughs> as the truth starts to come out. <laughs> that 
gotta say something else. My experience is that that's what's more important, to have people who can say, you know, my existence doesn't depend on you holding over me that I won't get my next job in a trade association or a company or a law firm if I don't do what's quite right for you. And this is true on all sides, right? So I'm, not, I'm not picking on any one trade association. This is equally true for those who defend Google's interests and those who defend the Motion Picture Association's interests. And many, many times I had to say to people in Washington, you know, go ahead and fire me because I have a job that pays more money elsewhere. Uh, and I can just leave. So um, that is really, really important, and that was a lesson I learned that any effective executive in administration needs to bring in people who are prepared to do the right thing because they say, you know, when this is done, I'm off to Dulles and I'm out of here. Well, I, I have to, to thank uh, Justin uh, that uh, kind comment. He, I always find him so charming as well. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that the, the, the thing is that he he he, he tell us that you know like uh, he was in the middle. I, from my side, he was really way down there in the other side. Uh, so 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 so. Uh, 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 well, well I, I saw that you were like really close to there. But, but so, uh, so, 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 so my point uh, is uh, just to clarify that for us was the priority to find a solution for the blind. And to achieve that, we have to change a culture. And, and if we change the culture, we will not only be solving the problem for the blind, but also for the libraries, for the educators, and so on. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know how. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, the, the idea that somehow the, the Obama administration was, you know, leading the way for the blind was not a widely shared belief by the people in the negotiation, um, uh, or many of the people involved in the negotiation, at least, at least, at least for my people uh, uh, within the WBU and, and, and elsewhere, at least, and I'm not speaking for all members, but certainly there was a lot of people that were pretty unhappy with a lot of the positions the United States had taken on different things. But uh, uh, people mentioned the, uh, I just want to mention a little briefly about the NGOs that were involved. Uh, there was not a huge delegation of NGOs that were involved for this thing. It was a little surprising that some of the groups that had played a very, very important role in the beginning, such as EFF, or uh, uh, public knowledge had contributed a lot. There's a lot of groups around. It was just a very expensive negotiation. I think we're having like four or five meetings a year after a while. And uh, uh, th there was a time when it was just a, a fairly small number of people, but some of them are here. Uh, uh, the NGOs, from, I think, from India and Brazil and South Africa were particularly impactful in the, uh, in, in, in the negotiations in Marrakesh. Uh, the library groups uh, for many years have followed this issue, going back to the 80s and things like that, when the WBU was providing the early leadership on this issue. And the WBU, because they had a such an extensive network of very articulate people around the world everywhere, and they're well organized, were extremely effective. And I think that if you think that replicating the success of this negotiation, it's, it's hard to imagine a group as talented and as deep and as committed as the World Blind Union and its members were and the, and, the, and the impact they had was really uh, extraordinary. And I think that what the World Blind Union did is they, they took a lot of people on all sides, uh, publishers, uh, any, any publisher lobbyist that attended very many sessions and any northern, uh, you know, like North America or European negotiator that attended many sessions eventually just became committed, I think, to a good outcome for blind people because it was just, you just couldn't help it. I mean, it was like, it was just such a, a compelling story. And so, you know, as much as I like to pat, you know, all of us like to pat ourselves in our bat, in some ways, the injustice of the status quo was really the thing that moved the treaty. And if we couldn't have moved this treaty, we were the worst activist ever, because this was like a, really a very compelling story, I thought. Uh, uh, in terms of the Obama administration, uh, the big change it was really in 2009 when Susan Crawford, who was in the White House, uh, and um, uh, Artie Rye at the Patent Office and Andrew McLaughlin, uh, along with Kareem Dale, that those four people really were mobilized to 
change the U.S. opposition to the treaty and try, trying to block it, saying it was premature and everything like that. Unfortunately, after Artie Rye and Susan Crawford left the administration, you could see a walk back in the position, and you saw a steady uh, attempt to divert the treaty, uh, to, 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 to take it off into a soft instrument. Uh, the U.S. proposal in 2010 was designed to make it end not as a treaty, but some kind of a uh, some kind of a, a non-binding recommendation that you know three or five years later they come back and look at. There was a lot of diversionary tactics on the stakeholder platform. You had the United States Patent and Trademark Office lobbying the Open Society Foundation, which is really the the one NGO I didn't mention, but it did more than anyone to make this thing happen. And particularly Vera Francis here. Vera, you can you raise your hand a bit? Vera, is she? If it wasn't for Vera, we'd be doing treaty. I, I'm afraid that's pretty obvious, I think. And she was actually lobbied uh, to kind of divert resources for supporting the treaty in one of these sort of non-treaty alternatives by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, when Stevie Wonder appeared at the WIPO General Assembly in 2010, you began to see kind of a, a shift among a lot of country delegates. It sort of made it more political with, it, uh, with ambassadors and things. What happened in 2011 is that the United States led an effort to eliminate deaf people as beneficiaries of the treaty uh, to accommodate the lobbying by the Motion Picture Association, a group that's on this panel even though they're not affected by the treaty. And in 2012, the Motion Picture Association, having achieved eliminating deaf people as beneficiaries, lobbied to admit audiovisual works altogether. And then when there was a deal that was negotiated on a three-step test, which took more time than you can possibly imagine, uh, the Motion Picture Association sought to blow that up because they'd already got every other red line they'd asked for, and they just moved on to the next set of red lines. And then you had the patent owners mobilized, principally through General Electric, but also groups like Exxon, Monsanto, Caterpillar. I mean, it was just an extraordinary uh, group of uh, activity by, I guess that's the time, you know, right? Uh, by the, um, uh, by an extraordinary group of opposition from that group. And, and actually, the World Blind Unit, one, I mean, the, the, the National Federation of Blind started putting up the, the, the pictures of the CEOs of these, these patent owner companies. And on a big billboard out in I-95 with, like, little discussions about what they were doing. And then uh, the Patent and Trademark Office to fill the, you know, a big um, FOIA thing. And they gave us 142 pages of emails from the Motion Picture Association of the Patent Office in terms of their lobbying efforts in opposition to it. And I think when, in the middle of the treaty, when the Washington Post put, published almost a full-page story about that, I think that was a, coincided maybe fortuitously with a, a, a real change in the negotiations in Marrakesh. And there was a deal available in really a, a matter of days after that. And that was quite important, I think, as well. And I think it also shows that when, when the press actually bothers to cover these things, the positions favoring the weaker party, favoring the users, favoring the consumers do much better when there's no press coverage. The same thing in, in terms of the when, when, when negotiations were in the public sessions, we were rarely going to get decisions that really went the wrong way. And all every, every time the United States European wanted to do some anti-consumer thing, they tried to move it into some private off-the-record session or, or threaten to ban people from the negotiation if they would tweet about it. We were banned from using Twitter and Facebook and anything that might shed some unfavorable light. Now, one time I asked a UN official about it, and he said, he said, you know that the people that are trying to do things that are good for blind people, they don't want it to be secret. And the people that are really wanting to do things that restrict their rights, they want it to be secret. And I'm not going to tell you who they are, but you can figure them out, and I think I will give you the same advice. Now, on the substantive thing, and I'll just wind up here, the MPA, not even a affected by the treaty, opposed fair use. They wanted a restrictive three-step test, and they did not want TPMs uh, broken in the treaty. They had kind of a split decision on the three-step test. They lost the other ones. But uh, uh, the, we found it convenient, I would just say this, not to attack the publishers in their position in Marrakesh because we thought they had a more legitimate position than the MPA. And I, and I talked to Alan. Alan's a little embarrassed because he wasn't in the Washington Post being criticized or anything. <laughs> and I said, well, we actually think the publishers have kind of a legitimate pushback on this because you guys are actually affected by the treaty. And so we choose to criticize the Motion Picture Association and Exxon and Monsanto for taking these positions because nobody was sympathetic to the motion picture industry. It wasn't even affected by taking these positions. So they were actually convenient for us in that respect in terms of the messaging. But uh, 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 I think that uh, 
in terms of the North South, so the African group is a big defender of user rights. It's true that they were at, at a certain point taking the hard line and putting everything together in a way everyone thought was, uh, uh, on my side, thought was unhelpful and unrealistic. But we were confident that they would be, in the end, the, the, the biggest defender of user rights. And that was the way it worked out. And Ruth was an, an outstanding advocate of consumer rights in the negotiation. The African group was so thrilled when she joined uh, their, uh, their, their group and worked closely with it. And actually, there was a lot of depth in the African group. I thought the, 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 the Egyptians, the, the, the Algerians, everyone was really, it was really a strong, the South Africans, it was really a strong delegation. And I thought in the North-South thing, there was an early split in the North, and that was what was critical. It normally WIPE was North-South, but the UK endorsed the treaty fairly early on. Switzerland started working with our side to the shock of everyone, and then some Northern European countries did and things like that. You saw it in the negotiation where the US was completely isolated on the TPM thing, with even Japan and Switzerland joining developing countries and Australia and things like that to complete within like the first couple of hours of the substantive negotiations. So it was a thrilling negotiation. It was an outstanding negotiation. And uh, we're glad it's doing. As far as the bigger political issues and things like that, there are bigger political issues for everyone that works on these issues. But there's no slippery slope. If anyone thinks it's a slippery slope, they haven't really tried to get anything done in a Geneva-based institution. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, as everyone would expect, I disagree with Jamie on so many things. First of all, I can show you the record, the record which has recently been produced in a FOIA, where I actually went to the WBU and said, your big problem is a lack of capacity. You aren't helping us. And I asked them, please get Scott and Melanie Brunson, who is not up here but might as well be Melanie Brunson, please get them involved more. And I urged Scott and Melanie to get involved more because they're very good lawyers and the WBU needed more legal capacity to participate. So I think Scott and Melanie and the record uh, will establish that from our perspective, the problem was the WBU wasn't bringing enough capacity to the table and I'm very thankful that the ACB and the NFB came in and kind of galvanized them more and helped us. Um, I disagree with Jamie's characterization that the unit, that of what he characterized the Obama administration doing. Again, I'm happy to put the record in front of you, the paper record, the actual formal record. Uh, in early 2010, when we introduced our consensus instrument, we said this can lead to a treaty. So we were always open to the idea of treaty. The European Union, it is true, formally supported a soft law instrument. Now, what Jamie doesn't tell you, and, and is quite interesting, and you should know that one of the reasons the European Union ultimately backed a treaty is they realized that the soft law instrument would have instant effect throughout the world, which I told them, if we do this, it is going to be a reinterpretation of Berne immediately. And when their legal counsels advise them, yeah, Hughes is right, that's what will happen under the Vienna Convention, they actually backed away from the joint recommendation. And by then, the substance of the four-way negotiations had moved far enough that they said, okay, we'll go for a treaty. Um, Jamie's right that a FOIA a lobbied by KEI uh, produced 150, or I'll accept uh, his representation of 150 plus uh, documents, pages of documents from the Motion Picture Association and the Patent and Trademark Office. But as per how acrimonious this debate is, after the treaty was finished, the PTO received a FOIA request from a conservative-minded think tank, and I will try to figure out whose fingerprints are on that, to produce all documents of communications between the PTO, the NFB, KEI, public knowledge. So I produced 250 documents, all right? So the idea that it's one side versus another side is just false, and Scott knows that, and I didn't have time to tell Melanie, so Melanie, I'm apologizing publicly, I didn't tell you. But it wasn't, you weren't, you, uh, some of your emails were there, but you weren't named in the FOIA request. So uh, there was an enormous amount of back and forth uh, uh, going on, and uh, so somewhere 250 plus documents of communications between the NFB and the PTO have been produced. Um, Again, folks, listen to very carefully to everything said. Jamie said, a split decision on the three-step test. Again, that's the mindset of this being a precedent and this being a football for a bigger battle. 
And the more you think about it that way, that was what we were always fighting against. We needed to make this really just about the issue that Jamie characterized should be a no-brainer, the one that activists shouldn't fail on. And if you start to envision it as, was this a split decision on this issue or that issue or that issue, that's, that's when it was that kind of mentality that was put us most at risk at each step of these negotiations. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the three-step test isn't substantive as far as blind people is concerned. One of the issues in the negotiation is whether or not you have uh, a limitation of the use of the exception when there's a commercially available alternative. That essentially is a three-step issue. And there's an issue within the three-step test as to whether the three-step test is uh, subject or uh, when it applies, for example, when the Berne Convention provides particular exceptions. It's not in the interest of blind people to have a restrictive interpretation of the three-step test any more than it is in the interest of any other user to have a restrictive interpretation of the, of the three-step test. So you can't take a position on the three-step test and say it's, it's only about precedent, but it's not about blind people. When we were in the negotiations, at one point, Justin uh, made this reference. There's, there's three parts to the three-step test. And he says, would you agree that Blind people are, you know, are like sort of like a small population, and which is sort of one of the issues of the three-step test. And we came back and said, well, there's a reason they call it the three-step test, not the one-step test. And all three steps are kind of important. I just want to also mention one other thing. David Hammerstein's here, and I forgot to mention David. It probably would be also no treaty if it wasn't for David Hammerstein, who actually, had, unfortunately, became blind during the negotiation. And I think he's, he's got his eyesight back here, but he... He, he, he got several hearings in the European Parliament that actually turned around the position of the European Union. And uh, uh, working closely with the European Blind Union and Dan Pescon and, and, and the other members of the European Blind Union. And in contrast, the U.S. Congress held zero hearings on the treaty. And there was a very small amount of correspondence from the U.S. Congress in comparison to the European Parliament. Is it on? Okay, great. Um, this uh, panel and our discussion uh, gives you um, a little taste of the appetizer portion of the negotiations. Um, it was intensely and at times extremely painfully difficult um, to talk about the same thing at the same time with the same interpretation. And I think that that was key because, I, you know, no matter how you frame people's perspectives, they are still perspectives and they are still deeply held beliefs and concerns. I think the one thing that is um, something I think all of us could agree on is the fact that um, it is true that Alan Adler um, played an important, quiet role um, during the negotiations. Um, the, the publishers who were going to be the most affected were the least outspoken um, in terms of expressing, uh, you know, comments that would create uh, a pushback um, at the political level, um, I think, globally. And it at the end, I'm still really reflecting on, on the road to Marrakesh, but I, I will say three things. The first is nobody could have gotten there alone. Everybody played a role. The um, extremely um, annoying and frustrating demands from the motion picture industry, the difficult and, and very painful sort of interactions amongst the delegates, especially um, at the 99th hour when, when push came to shove. The sense of frustration by um, the least developed countries who felt that their positions were um, difficult to uh, get on the table. And the overall sense that no matter how narrowly we had described the goals and objectives, this was still going to be a significant milestone and a significant sea change in both the way white book functions, but also in the international copyright system. And there was no getting around that. 
And the real question, I think Nancy put it best, the real question was how, how could we do good without doing bad? And often, I think, as in life in general, doing good has a cost. And being involved in doing good means that you are constantly assessing what are the trade-offs, what costs can we live with, what costs can we not afford. And that calculus was extremely important in getting to yes. Second point that um, you know I want to make, the difficulty of getting to yes reflects, in my mind, ironically, the importance of copyright. The fact that so many people cared about getting or not getting a treaty um, was amazing to me because it wasn't just um, the visually impaired community that got um, galvanized. Many other public interest groups um, First Amendment, consumer protection, um, libraries, um, educational institutions, government um, officials who were looking for opportunities to recalibrate domestic laws. There was interest all across the board. And that meant there was risk, opportunity, and danger all across the board. And the role of the negotiators was to navigate through that in a way that reflects the importance of copyright and the importance of what copyright is intended to do, which is to serve the public. That is not a tricky or an easy job, no matter who is negotiating. And I think all of us, personally, professionally, and in our roles as negotiators, had to figure out what is our personal calculus what is the strategic calculus? And what is the most important calculus to make to get us to yes? And that process took lots of conversations between Justin and I, Luis and I, um, um, Alan and I um, uh, talked. I talked with the MPAA, talked with the government officials in Nigeria, the Africa Group, the World Blind Union. Everybody had to be engaged. And I think that's why people refer to this as the miracle of Marrakesh, because it was a miracle. Um, not only to get to yes, but to get to yes in a way that was meaningful. Um, and we could spend hours talking about this road, but the fact that we arrived is, is really, I think, a real miracle. My third and my last point um, is also to reiterate something that both Justin and Jamie um, um, said. They didn't agree, they just both, they said them individually, independently. One is the important role of NGOs. Um, for governments where accountability to the public interest is minimal because of weak institutions, weak democratic uh, cultures, the NGOs were vital. I mean, I can tell you that the Nigerian Copyright Commission um, got visited by the blind community. Nigeria happened to have had the first um, blind uh, professor. Um, on the African continent, and he, the first thing he did um, after uh, getting his PhD in England and moving back to Nigeria um, was to set up um, an organization that basically thrived on infringement. What they did was they made early generation audio books. They would read them out loud, record them, and make them available to the illiterate population in the northern parts of Nigeria where uh, illiteracy um, is extremely high, both because of religious um, um, dominance there and also because of poverty there. And so for 30 years, this is an organization that has just produced works to help with educating the blind community. That history was really significant politically for the Nigerian government. Um, and it was important um, for the NGO community, uh, backed by the NGO uh, community globally, uh, to play the kind of role that it did. That said, um, it took the right people, just as in the United States you needed to have under Secretary of uh, Commerce Capos and Artie and Justin and Nancy and all this you know, amazing array of, of folks in place, um, Justin made the point that um, you had to have people who had a sense of principle and the courage of conviction. Because there was no end to the um, threats to get me fired. And I said, I don't have a job. There's nothing to fire me from, right? Um, this was an, you know, I was doing this pro bono. I was, I was, like I said, literally plunged into it. It wasn't really like they could fire me. Um, but interestingly enough, the current administration in Nigeria has a policy of using um, 
expatriate expertise with local citizenship rights to do a lot of things. And they had recalled from London, a London-born, London-bred um, uh, direct individual who became the director of the Copyright Commission. And because the UK backed the treaty, and he was directing the Nigerian Copyright Commission, um, uh, decided this is the thing that Nigeria had to do. And so working, it was the only time that I had ever heard a foreign government official of a developing country, particularly a common law former British colony, say, by golly, our British heritage has to mean something. <laughs> um, and so it became, it was actually quite amazing. So, you know, we were having these conference calls with the UK and um, all of the Commonwealth countries. Um, and it was this sort of moment of reliving colonial history. It was just very bizarre. But there we were, all agreeing on this point. And having the right people with the right convictions, with the courage of that conviction, um, no matter what side of this treaty they were on, was important. And I think at the end of the day, we all had our different paths to getting there. But at the end of the day, believing that you could do it and that it was important to do and that it had to be done was really vital. Scott said something about not seeing this as a copyright treaty and seeing this as a human rights treaty. And I think that was more scary to many industry groups than anything else. Because to characterize this as a human rights treaty um, really opens the door in more ways than I think um, those who were concerned about the normative changes, um, as Chris has mentioned, um, were, were comfortable with. And so I think what you're going to see as we move forward in terms of implementation um, is that there will be two tracks where there will be people implementing this as a human rights treaty. Um, and there will be people, in, countries, excuse me, implementing this as a copyright uh, treaty, um, the first of its kind. Um, and then I think the future is not something that we can map out in, in a field where the interests are entrenched, the politics are complex, and the welfare um, concerns are always looming on the horizon. Chris, and then Scott, and then I think we ought to, this, I have another question I want to put to all of you, but first I'd like to find out what the, what the audience would like to know about. So Chris, and then Scott. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, it, it's very important to recall the context in which this negotiation was taking place. Um, there, there was and continues to be uh, effort made in Geneva uh, to, to revisit uh, some of the foundations of the WIPO. And um, this particular negotiation was indeed uh, seen by some uh, as a flagship for some of, those, uh, some of that agenda. Uh, I think that's evident from some of the comments that have been made here this afternoon. Uh, and so, you know, representing a sector um, in the United States, at least, that represents tens of thousands of jobs that, uh, and, and creates quality works uh, that are then seen around the world, uh, it, it's our responsibility to make sure that the foundations on which that success is built are defended and, and kept uh, and not sacrificed unnecessarily. And we did see the, the absolute um, need for a treaty uh, to deal with the needs of the visually impaired, as I said. Uh, and we believed firmly that it could be done without sacrificing the other uh, very legitimate interests that some were trying to undermine. Um, and so we, we, we were very active in trying to um, fit this compelling, uh, I think, human rights issue within the context of a copyright treaty um, in a way that didn't undermine what, what existed. And I think that that has been uh, achieved largely, and that's to the credit of the negotiators. And uh, we hope that we've contributed uh, in, in some way some inspiration to some of the outcomes. Um, but the, the principles that were at stake that some were trying to undermine are, are fundamental to the existence of a sector that is important to um, not only this country's interest. Uh, Ruth mentioned Nollywood. Uh, there's an interest there. They readily understood that they had a need to make sure that their own interests were not undermined unnecessarily. Uh, and that's true for others as well and for other segments of the copyright industry. And so this is, this was uh, a difficult process. 
Uh, it's one in which our, our motivations were continuously challenged. It was necessary to, and, and this is uh, to, the, to the credit of the National Federation of the Blind, to sit down and have a discussion with them and ultimately produce a joint declaration between the, the leader of the National Federation of the Blind, Dr. Maurer, who's sitting here, and our CEO, uh, Senator Chris Dodd, in which we reaffirmed our mutual commitment to this treaty. Uh, and I think we demonstrated through, through the process that we had the commitment to get a treaty that did what was needed uh, and what was called for in, this, uh, in, the, in the circumstances, but not uh, make unnecessary sacrifices of the interests of others. It's always a challenge for me to be brief, but I will do my best. It's the nature of my training, excellent training, which I received, by the way, at the University of Minnesota Law School. All right. No offense to AU here, but anyway. It really took everybody sitting at this table and others in the room. And when I say everybody, I mean the representation of those interests. If, if it wouldn't have been for KEI, there'd be no treaty. If it wouldn't have been for MPAA, it wouldn't be no treaty. And on and on and on. And the miracle of Marrakesh really was that we found a way to bring all of this together and get to yes. The MPAA took a lot of heat. The NFB took a lot of heat for joining with the MPAA. But what I felt and what we felt our job was, was in, the, in this vortex of all these competing interests, let's keep the train on the track. Because this, for us, was a civil rights issue. Never before has there been an international legal instrument especially and particularly aimed at the issues faced by blind and visually impaired people. This was the first one. Now, yes, I know there's the CRPD and there are other instruments, but this was something aimed specifically at us at one of our biggest, maybe our biggest barrier. That is lack of information, lack of access to information. So we felt that's what, this is why we've always pushed for a treaty. Now, you know, Professor Hughes and the other professors tried to convince me, well, maybe, you know, soft law wouldn't be so bad. And uh, I think you had some legitimate arguments there, Justin. However, to us, it was more than a soft law solution because to us, a soft law solution smacked of a second class solution one that wasn't really enforceable. In other words, it would be an acknowledgement by the international community, that, yeah, you've got a problem, you've got some issues, but it's not worth a treaty. It's not worth putting down into, quote, unquote, black letter law. We believed the opposite, and that's why we lobbied so hard for the treaty solution. And yes, it's true in terms of implementation and instant precedential value, I suppose the treaty technically has none yet. But ladies and gentlemen, we've changed the world with this treaty. And whether it's been ratified anywhere or acceded to or whatever, it already has changed the world and has changed the discussion. A couple other things real quick. Um, you know, in, in Marrakesh there was a huge blow up over TPMs. And like everything else in this matter, it really didn't focus on the issues we were concerned about. And we worked with a lot of people, including the MPAA, to say, hey, look, the issue of technical protection measures is very narrow here with respect to our interests. Authorized entities ought to be able to break TPMs to put books into accessible formats. That's all we want. And that's what we got. And it took the leadership of a lot of people, Justin and Ruth and, and Chris and Jamie and all, I mean, I could go on naming all the people, to co finally come together and say, yes, we can find language that gets this done and doesn't open up the parade of horribles for the rest of the industry and the, the rest of the interests held by rights holders. So 
it really did take everybody to get this done, and it took everybody to be creative and think of new ways. And you have a lot of crea creative people sitting before you and sitting in the audience. And, you know, just this panel, I hope, has illustrated for you the, just the amazing accomplishment because the fourth, fifth day into Marrakesh, I thought this thing was done. I thought I was going to come home and report to the National Federation of the Blind because we had our convention immediately after Marrakesh. I thought I was going to report a failure. Uh, but, because, you know, we went into this whole process. There were 37 unresolved issues in the text as we started Marrakesh. So that, I'll stop there. I could say a lot more as usual, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Scott. So questions for the, the panel, either for individuals or collectively. Uh, Scott, you mentioned that there's a mic down here. We can try to pass it back over, but they can shout. I can shout. Let's give it a try. Hi, Scott Peter, Planet Six. I'm standing here with a crossbow on my back. My back is broken. I was disabled for five years. My intro into this conversation is I went to art school back. I think I'm better without the mic. I went to art the school. Webcast, the webcast. Hi. I went to, to Pratt and graduated in 1978, and I've been in licensing ever since. So I am one of those rare artists that is late to speaking up about the value of intellectual property and the value of royalties. Since December, when I started speaking up, I've been moving the copyright ball forward by explaining the experience of the 2D arts IP owner and creator. And I learned about Chafee Amendment at a hearing where Benetex Fruchterman spoke. And I did my homework and research, and boy, oh boy, was it an eye-opener. I had a judge look at the text for the Chafee Amendment because I thought I read it right. But from what was testified at a judiciary hearing, I was understanding I read it wrong. I read it right. The Chafee Amendment does not preclude royalties being paid for IP. And that is the premise that Fruchterman and Benetech have been actively promoting the book share program for both the visually blind as well as for the human rights. And I think it's important to understand, while well, you're addressing everybody up there, I read your bios, you've all had jobs all of your life. I come from that community that is global. Some of us who work our whole lives and never have a job, we're entrepreneurs, we're small business owners, we're the students at the art schools, we're the lawyer who goes to law school and decides to build his own law firm. So clarify in your agreements going forward, Chafee does not say no, do not pay um, royalties. It actually defers back to Section 107, and Clause 4 of 107 is the one that addresses that you cannot cut off someone's income in order to declare something safe harbor or fair use. And I thought it was so important to speak up. And Chris, I know Dodd, uh, Chris Dodd, I've known him from, I covered the Hill as a retirement career. And this is a point I've made to him. We need to get our argument correct. Every actor who depends on their SAG payments is losing income because of mispresentation and not standing up to people to say, that's how we make our living. It's a make it or break it. Thank God I had my money set aside. And that has given me the ability to come and speak up and clarify that every drawing, every written word, every website, everything that's being marketed as a, as Ruth said, a copyright is to serve the public. No, no, it's a property right that belongs to the creator or the owner. And I see someone shaking their head. We can debate that later. From the world I come from, it absolutely does. So I thought I would put forth for the 2D arts IP community. Um, there's a perception, you know, you had the 37 problems that you had to work through at, that la at the diplomatic conference. But there's a perception that something happened near the very end that got everybody's act together. Is that perception true? And would you like to comment on that? Thank you. Um, my name is Melanie Brunson, and I, I am an attorney with the American Council of the Blind. And um, I, I was at the Marrakesh 
conference, I'd been involved in the whole process from almost the beginning. And I was sitting here thinking about all of the things that have been said, and I certainly can agree um, with a lot that was said. But I'd like to, um, I'm glad that Carrie asked the question that she did, because I think from my perspective that one of the reasons why we got where we did in Marrakesh was because the World Blind Union, as, as Justin said, there were some issues about um, capacity along the way. But when we got to the point where we saw um, the process coming to Marrakesh, the World Blind Union delegation sat down and said, okay, what are the four or five basic bottom line things that have to happen in order to make certain that the instrument that comes out of Marrakesh is is usable. I, my mic just went away. Oh. Oh, okay. The um, what are the bo the bottom line principles that will guarantee that this instrument will be usable and implementable? Because so often the thing that I was concerned about was that people really got off into the weeds during the discussions and things got we were afraid that the thing was going to be so complicated nobody would know what was in it so um, we came up with some basic principles the overarching one being please keep it stoop simple stupid <laughs> keep it simple so that it's understandable and then there were some other issues around how to deal with some of the concepts like the um, countries that required commercial um, exception had commercial availability issues in their exceptions and limitations and some other issues so but we stuck to them and I think that it became clear that these were the important issues and eventually um, that among other things made um, made people say, okay, this has to happen in order for the, if these things are the important things, then we need to find a way to include them. And so I think that the World Blind Union um, delegation had a, a major role in, in bringing about this, this miracle, as much as all of the rest of the people that you've been hearing from. Ruth was right, none of us could have done it alone. It took everybody. But it was, um, it was certainly um, helpful, I think, to have the basic bottom line principles and in place that needed to be a part of the agreement. Thank you. What's the one? No, it's not. Okay, good. All right. Uh, with respect to the comment made regarding remuneration and the rights of copyright holders, our purpose was never to upset the system and deny payment to rights holders. Uh, we can have a philosophical disagreement about the purpose of copyright, whether it's truly a property right or whether it's something greater than that, but that was never our purpose. And if you look at the treaty text, you know, it does allow for remuneration. Uh, in, you know, in national law. Now, with respect to what happened, I, I think Melanie's right. The WBU stuck to the same line, and we didn't change our positions. And we, there was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of negotiating. But we, we were very organized and stuck to a common theme, a common message. And it was articulated best, I think, at a press conference we held uh, on Monday, the second Monday of the conference, where before the conference center, <clears throat> our leaders, uh, Mary Ann Diamond from Australia, who uh, had served as, was serving as the chairperson of our uh, Right to Read campaign, uh, a former president of the WBU, Fred Schroeder, first vice president of the World Blind Union, uh, put on a press conference, and we had other speakers. But we told the world how important this was. And it did receive international coverage, and I think it did make a difference. And one of my favorite things about that press conference was is we had a table there with a bunch of books on it. 
200 books to be precise. 198 of them were wrapped in chains. And we had a big old padlock hanging from the chains. And, and we said to the international community, to the negotiators, unlock this information. And there were two little lonely books there sitting alone without chains, and that represented the small amount of information to which we did have access. So I think that had an impact. I think also, quite frankly, you know, Mustafa Kalfi, the Minister of Communications for Morocco, made a very impassioned speech to the uh, delegates and said, hey, listen, uh, and then he, then he uh, talked about Justin's idea. I'm going to close these airports. I have the power to do that. We can get that done, and we'll do it. Now, you know, I, it was sort of a half-hearted comment, but I, I, on the other hand, I think he really meant it. Uh, so there the really there became the leadership. It was led by the World Blind Union uh, in terms of leading this effort and gaining this momentum, and then we were joined by a lot of other people of goodwill, and that's why it finally came together. Um, there is, just to answer the lady in the back from, uh, who graduated from Pratt, uh, Article 4.5 uh, does permit a main member state to engage in remuneration in the exercise of limitations and exceptions. It's not mandatory, but it was written into the treaty and written very early. Very early, that was agreed that that was an optional approach for a country. Um, to answer Kerry, we had had among the kind of leadership delegations, a series of conference calls before the diplomatic conference started because things look so grim. And we agreed on a plan to cycle through the big issues. Um, because one danger was we would go in and say, okay, we'll start with this issue and then that issue. But if we agreed that we were not going to move off the first issue until it was done, the conference could flounder just on one issue. So we agreed to a certain amount of time of negotiating sessions for each issue, and we would cycle through them. And the reason it was becoming so depressing was because we were cycling through the issues without getting them done. So um, that's why it was looking so grim. You know, we're going through all the issues, and we aren't clearing them off the table. If we had failed on the first, but we cleared the second off the table, and we made progress on the third, and we failed on the fourth, at least we would have felt the cycle was working. But that's why, that's why feeling, people were feeling so despondent. Um, commercial availability across borders was an uh, issue that just took up an enormous amount of negotiating time. And when it reached the point where we had produced a text, the text was so much like the tax code. It was just as <laughs> Melanie feared. And, and you could read anything into it or out of it that you wanted. And that just took up, I think, two days, probably, probably two or three days. And it was just enormously painful. And at the end, it was a compromise to jettison that in, in, in exchange, in essence, in exchange for some additional protections on, on the three-step test that would make copyright holders feel more secure. And the European Union had been the principal advocate on commercial availability across borders. The U.S. had been agnostic. And, and that's really, that was not actually the first thing that made us feel good, but that was the thing. When we got that breakthrough, we thought, okay, everything else has to be done. We'll get it done. Um, now, I love Scott and Melanie dearly, but I have to tell you something about the press conference. And that is, um, when you're negotiating 15 hours a day, you don't pay much attention to anything else. And the truth is you don't really observe a lot of what else is happening because you start your day at 8 a.m. and you finish your day at 10 p.m., but because of the time difference, you then have to call back and report what is happening. So you're having a conference call with Washington every night. And for our delegation and I think for the Brazilian delegation and the EU delegation and the Mexican delegation, there was just not a lot of awareness of what else is happening. So we were aware of the press conference, but it, it wasn't, by the time you're entering the hot box, the kind of crucible of these negotiations, you aren't paying an awful lot of attention to anything happening any, anywhere else. You know, there could have been a tsunami and the vice president could have been assassinated and, you know, knock on wood, I wouldn't have known. Um, so um, 
I think I think that it really is once you go into that lockbox, it's it's pretty closed environment. Yeah, I was uh, just going to highlight a little bit of what Justin said already, which was things were getting very complicated. So kind of going back to sort of the basics uh, was was very important, and also. Um, uh, another thing that Justin just said is that there actually is a lot of flexibility that's built into that treaty. Now, sometimes that worries me because I think then we have the issues about implementation and how is this going to be put together. Um, just something to respond to Melanie. Uh, the U.S. government, I think, was also very similar with what are our principles going in here and, and staying consistent to those, which is that we do recognize that, there, that we have some core values about access. We do recognize that there's an issue here. We do think it's appropriate role for governments to intervene here and that we also want to make sure that we're doing this consistent with international obligations. And the statement put together with the U.S. talks about how the importance of enforcing international intellectual property rights, but also the importance of exceptions and limitations that allow the system to work. And then I just wanted to say one final thing, that I really do think that the role of NGOs was essential here. I think there, I've been involved in a couple of uh, treaty negotiations where the issues are really brought to the attention by NGOs. Uh, in this case, I think KEI and WBU and uh, the library associations played a very active role at the beginning. I've been involved in negotiations where the Motion Picture Association has played a very active role in the beginning. And I think that you need the um, very active engagement because these are complicated issues that have a lot of impacts. I think that this particular uh, treaty, I always thought of it as a three-legged stool, which was that you had the individuals who are blind or print disabled, you had the publishers. Um, and content owners, and you also had the authorized entities. The authorized entities are absolutely essential to the effective functioning of this particular instrument. And my concern at the beginning was how do you make sure that this is, that we're going to be able to negotiate something that actually can work and can be implemented. And I, I also am, I think that what Chris has said here is that you also have an instrument that um, it takes place in an overall context that has implications for everybody. So I think the lesson learned is that it's, it's important to have active engagement from all interested parties and that also um, you need to be able to come together and have discussions and synthesize different positions and step above and say what is the issue that we're trying to resolve here and how can everybody work a little bit flexibly so that it can be addressed. Just, uh, <clears throat> we're out of time. Uh, three points I want to make. One is, uh, uh, and this, this question that Kerry had about kind of what, what changed things, the dynamics. I mean, obviously, there was a lot going on, and it wasn't just one, one or two things. But on Saturday, which was the, really the grimmest time, it's when the Francis Gurry and, and, and the Moroccans were up there telling everybody everything was going to go to hell, and, and the United States had been telling the blind groups that it was going to be no treaty. Uh, Stevie Wonder. Well, Jim Fruchtman and the NFP had, had reached out to Stevie Wonder, and Stevie Wonder had cut a, a video, which uh, White Bull started playing nonstop in the, in, the, in the big room, where Stevie Wonder said, if you finish by the end of the week, I will fly to, uh, I will fly to uh, Marrakesh, and I will do a, um, do a concert. And, and that, that really put a lot of pressure on the delegates. And, and of course, Stevie Wonder did that. I mean, he actually flew in on, on Friday and actually did, did a concert, which was amazing. But I mean, like, that was actually, that was, I think, kind of a, in, in, you know, that, that, that kind of raised, raised the stakes for people. And then that day, like, like right around, because uh, we were, you know, several hours different, so uh, the Washington Post put up on its webpage the story that was going to appear in the Sunday paper, which took almost a full page of the paper, about the uh, about the uh, the industry lobbying against the treaty, and at that point there was a woman that was on the U.S. Interagency Committee uh, back in Washington, and she told me when she read that she saw that on the internet, she said she said she wrote other people and she said we're going to have a treaty now, and this was someone who was opposed to a treaty, but when she saw that she just figured, and she felt just you know that was it that there were the compromises were going to be made, and thirdly I just wanted to say that. Ecuador hasn't really got enough credit for this whole thing. As someone that was involved with the WBU and circulating their early draft of the treaty, it was Ecuador was the first country 
to, because of uh, the vice president of the country was, uh, had a disability, was interested in this issue, had agreed to table it even before Brazil or any other country, constantly and throughout the whole period, and, and changes that they had in the patent office and things like that were very supportive of this initiative, and they brought in Lewis, who had been the, the originator with Chile of the agenda item which, which created the, uh, the event in the first place. And I think that, that uh, Ecuador's, uh, I mean, Lewis, Lewis uh, really, along with uh, Ruth and some other people, really did an absolutely amazing job on behalf of consumer interest in this. Thank you. And th thank you, Peter, very much. And I, I, Peter didn't mention it, but Peter was also at the 2008 <laughs> expert group, um, along with uh, Ruth and Lewis uh, and several people in the audience here, uh, that, that, that was discussing the initial draft that eventually became the treaty. Um, and thank you for doing this session. Thank you, Peter. Um, just to, to respond to the question about what changed things, um, I think there were both personal level changes and then there were sort of political dynamic changes. Um, for me, the first significant change really happened in January when a group of um, some of the lead delegations met in Geneva over a weekend um, and hashed out um, a, a basic sort of